Um, I had learned about revolution through the wonderful invention of Facebook, which there was a page that did not announce that there would be a revolution, but rather announced that there would be a day of protests against police brutality, and that's how it started. Mubarak was an entrenched dictator. His apparatus was very much in place. The media, just as it was, the police force, just as it was, the military, all the different apparatus, all the different institutions in the country. But all that were to change drastically three days later. On January 25th, when people took to the streets, and the police and the uh, secret intelligence police and all the other uh, government uh, security forces did not for a second expect for this to happen, for this to happen the way it did. They expected, as per the previous instances of demonstrations, a few hundred people, a few thousand at most, in one single location, you know, the massive security forces with their you know, batons and their famous black helmets and black suits coming out of the you know, notorious uh, blue car, blue trucks, would flood the streets, round people up, take them to jail, beat some people up, and then this thing would be over. Everybody would be dispersed. What they found was an organizational capacity that they could not have expected. There were 10 locations advertised on Facebook, publicly that is, but a, a secret 11th location as well. And that one was uh, via the youth movements of various existing political parties. And then they practiced, they rehearsed, going through the streets and timing themselves. They broke themselves up into 10 smaller groups that started from 10 different locations that would arrive at a concurrent position in this slum area at the exact same time. So as to not give a heads up to the police that something was happening. And they rehearsed this, they walked fast, they walked slow, they took the traffic into consideration, they timed it perfectly. It came the day of the 25th, that 11th group broke itself up into 10 smaller groups. Only one single person in each of those groups knew what was happening. And they went through the various parts of the slum area, calling people down. They slowly snowballed. By the time they arrived at this concurrent position, they were in the thousands. Now at that point, because of the critical mass and because of the, uh, the group effect, people felt more comfortable joining. It was a larger group, so they quickly snowballed even further. By the time they made it to the main street, outside of the slum area, they were in such a large group that the police could not deal with them. And the police did not get word of this until that point, so they were not prepared. This was the only group that made it into Tahrir Square on the 25th. Every other group was dispersed, just as was expected. And this was key because that was the chink in the armor that was the crack in the wall. And as a result of the success of that group in that day, even though this was not technically the start of the massive you know, uh, street you know, movements that we saw on the 28th, it was the reason why the 28th happened. The 28th is a Friday. And this is a natural day of uh, uh, assembly for Muslims because of the Friday prayer. And it's something that no government can stop. And so already everybody was praying in all the various mosques, there's so many of them in Cairo and all over Egypt. And as soon as the prayer ended, what the government really feared occurred. Without any, any direct organization or coordination, everybody rose up together. Now there were obviously individuals that knew what they were doing, but the rest were just responding to the situation. And that movement quickly blossomed into the revolution, the 28th, not the 25th, but the 28th. And by the end of that day, Tahrir Square was ours. After a long, brutal day of battling the right police, tear gas, canisters, rubber bullets, batons, you name it, you know, the crossing of the bridge, the smoke that you saw, the turned over cars, the blown up you know, trucks, all that happened that day. Now since that day, the group, the youth leaders had the right vision to not leave Tahrir Square. They wanted to remain there in a vigil. And this was key because that started the next phase of the revolution, which was Staying in Tahrir Square, the square with a list of demands and not going home. Now that you had critical mass there, the government, with no, you know, security forces were dispersed. They were no longer in effect. They had been beaten badly after all these years of brutal suppression. They basically just ran away, and they could not show their faces again. Their leadership uh, was ostracized and removed by President Mubarak, and the security forces no longer were in the streets. And then you had this massive population in Tahrir Square that had these demands, so the pressure was on, and time was on our side. We didn't know, we did not know that necessarily, 
but that's what it was. We did not ask for Mubarak to leave when we first started on the 25th, and we did not, did not ask for an end of the regime. But as a result of his mistakes and the more brutal suppression, the animalistic approach to what was a very humane um, request, the, the demands changed, and now it was a question of, you're gone. We cannot deal with you, you do not comprehend, you do not understand. And already people felt that way, but they wanted to get that last chance, and the last chance was not taken. So that now became a call of the revolution. And after a lot of attempts by government forces, including the Democratic National Party, the single ruling party in Egypt at the time, um, where they brought thugs, and some of you may have heard of the Camel incident in Tahrir Square, and they tried to create the impression that it was people versus people, and what are we supposed to do? Some want Mubarak, some don't want Mubarak. They're fighting it out. We'll just see who wins. We can't really interfere. But obviously, it was a hatched plan, and that failed miserably because of the bravery and the courage of those who remained in the higher square fighting what was essentially um, armed forces who were not dressed in their military uniforms, but they were armed as such, and other hooligans and you know, bullies that they had brought from uh, the different slums that worked with the Democratic National Party. The people won. The people lost a lot of you know, life and limb, but they won. They maintained the higher square, and since that day, the movement blossomed further and went from the hundreds of thousands to millions. And this continued until the demand of the people was so strong. And at one point in time, 12 million people were in the streets at various points in time, from Alexandria all the way to Upper Egypt and obviously in Cairo, to the point where the, the military had to make a choice. And this is the main difference between, I suppose, the Egyptian revolution and the revolution in Syria, is that the military uh, in Egypt has a tradition of never firing against the people. It considers itself an institution that works for, for the people and not for the president, as opposed to the police force, which was badly beaten by the people. And so they made the right choice to give the president an ultimatum, fix this in 24 hours, or we're going to have to side with the people. They couldn't fix it in 24 hours. It was his fourth weak speech that did not address any of our concerns. We came out even larger on that last Friday, the 11th, and he had to go. 